start with the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between the U.S. and Canada, and it has an interesting history. It's an element within the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909, which I will bet most of you have never heard of. The Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909 between the two countries was written primarily to protect water quantity. It came about during a time of increasing demand for Great Lakes water. The two governments recognized the need to fairly apportion the water between the U.S. and Canada and to protect the Great Lakes from overdiversion, such as the opening of the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal in 1900, which initially lowered the lake levels by six inches. While the main focus of the 1909 treaty was on quantity, it did recognize the threat of pollution and included Article 4 that stated that the boundary waters and the water flowing across the boundaries shall not be polluted. Shall is an important government word. It means mandatory. To oversee the treaty, the two countries established the International Joint Commission, or IJC, which is a six-member board with three Canadian and three U.S. appointees. Now let's fast forward about 60 years. The IJC, part of the original treatment, the original treaty, and still functioning in 1970 as an independent board providing advice to both countries, issues an alarming report that municipal and industrial pollution is causing harm to residents and property on both sides of the lake. If you were around at this time, it was a time of growing public interest in the environment and also events like the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland catching fire. In response to the IJC and public pressure, the two countries agreed to amend by protocol the Boundary Waters Treaty to address water quality. The new protocol was called the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and was signed by U.S. President Richard Nixon and Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau in 1972 with the stated purpose to restore and enhance water quality in the Great Lakes. The agreement has been amended in 1978, 1983, 1987, and still very active today. Its most recent renewal was in 2012. The thing you should all know about the agreement is that it's a soft law. The agreement describes what the two countries hope to achieve, but has no funding for program implementation and no compliance or enforcement authorities. Despite these rather obvious shortcomings, though, the agreement has been, in my opinion, remarkably successful in upgrading the protection of the lakes. Through the agreement, the two countries began to use a basin-wide ecosystem approach for the five lakes. Because of the agreement, the two federal governments began addressing lake-wide problems. This was a really big step, because in the not-too-distant past, the two countries, the eight states, and the two provinces primarily focused on nearshore pollution problems. Finally, the agreement significantly moved the science of protecting the lakes forward. Both countries now make monies available for both pure and applied research to protect the Great Lakes. This is where, now I come to the part where I get involved. In 1987, the two countries renewed and amended the agreement, and through this process, three very important elements were added. First, lake-wide management plans, or LAMPs as we call them. These are comprehensive whole lake strategies, one for each lake, designed to address the most serious problems such as too many nutrients flowing into the lake, toxic substances, or legacy issues with contaminated sediments. Second, areas of concern. These are specific geographic areas selected by the two countries where there is significant impairment of beneficial uses. These use impairments include things like beach closings, fish tumors, restrictions on dredging. Third, remedial action plans or RAPs are site-specific plans for areas of concern to address and ultimately eliminate the impaired beneficial uses. Right now, there are 43 areas of concern in the Great Lakes Basin. There's 26 in the United States, 17 in Canada. We share five between the two countries. There's 14 in Michigan and one in Indiana, Grand Calumet River and Indiana Harbor Ship Canal. When the speaker series invited me to speak, and I am on the speaker series board, my friends asked me to tell the audience about what I did in Northwest Indiana. So I will. It was late 1988, and I was a first line supervisor in the Chicago EPA office managing the Indiana, Ohio enforcement section where we developed civil enforcement cases for violations of the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. I had just come into the position from the agency's Great Lakes office where I was part of the U.S. team that actually developed the 1987 amendments to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. 
In this new position, I inherited several major ongoing enforcement actions, one against the city of Gary, Indiana, one against the city of Hammond, Indiana. Plus, my staff had just started working on developing a very large Clean Water Act case against United States Steel Gary Works. However, now is a great place to stop and give you all a brief primer on the mechanisms that EPA and the states use to protect human health and the environment. First, EPA is a regulatory agency, not a science agency like NOAA. EPA regulates what people, industry, and business can do with and to the environment. However, science and engineering guide our action. EPA is responsible for ensuring compliance with the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, and the Safe Drinking Water Act. And each of these laws share five common features, standards, permitting, reporting, monitoring, compliance, and enforcement. Also, each of these laws allows EPA to authorize state pollution control agencies to carry out the laws in their, in their states. In our case, it's the Michigan DEQ. EPA also has authority under Superfund, but this law cannot be delegated or passed down to the states. And you should keep in mind that almost all EPA and state environmental enforcement actions are initiated because of permit violations, and almost everything we did in Northwest Indiana was based on permit violations of one or more of major federal environmental statutes. The Northwest Indiana Initiative was a direct response to the 1987 amendments to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Northwest Indiana had been a threat to the south end of, the lake, south end of lake Michigan for years, but now is officially designated as a U.S.-Canadian area of concern, and there was even greater pressure to act. And as most of you know, this is a gritty, very, very industrialized area. It's the home to 40% of the U.S. steel industry. It has the country's largest inland petroleum refinery, as well as one of the largest cement plants in the U.S. What I quickly learned was that noncompliance with federal and state environmental laws was practically the rule. Also, legacy pollution was a huge problem. This is the stuff left over after a century of heavy industry. Millions of cubic yards of contaminated sediments and millions of gallons of petroleum-based compounds floating on top of the groundwater and all of this slowly migrating into Lake Michigan. This area also has three major cities, Gary, Hammond, and East Chicago, each with significant populations of minorities and poor people who needed to be considered in everything we hoped to achieve. Using what I learned, I laid out a five-goal plan. First, ensure compliance with all environmental statutes. Second, remediate the millions of cubic yards that contaminated sediments. Third, address the millions of gallons of petroleum product floating on top of the groundwater. Fourth, encourage pollution prevention. This is recycling and reuse. And five, expand and improve public involvement. Here's a map of the area. To implement the plan, We'd, we would undertake an aggressive enforcement sweep throughout the area. We'd work with the Army Corps of Engineers so that the Corps could dredge the Indiana Harbor and Ship Canal to slow the migration of contaminated sediments into the lake. We'd hold lots and lots of public meetings to involve the people, and we'd try to engage citizen and environmental activist groups. We'd work with the state of Indiana, local units of government, and local business councils to encourage pollution and prevention, and we'd try to help with grants if we could. And per the floating oil, truthfully, we didn't know what we were going to do. But we had our fingers crossed that we'd figure something out. I can tell you this, in the end, it did work. It worked even better than we thought, and it's still going on. Now I want to describe two of our most important accomplishments, and please know that this was a team effort. I worked with a very large number of talented individuals within EPA, the Department of Justice, the state of Indiana, and among the citizens of Northwest Indiana. So now my first story is about U.S. Steel Gary Works. The case we took against U.S. Steel Gary Works was very important from several perspectives. First, how we finally got the company to negotiate. Second, the very positive precedent we set. And third, the very strong message it sent through the area. U.S. Steel Gary Works has been the largest integrated steel making facility in North America for over 100 years. When we started the Northwest Indiana Initiative, U.S. Steel caused a massive fish kill through a huge spill into the east branch of the Grand Calumet River. It was an egregious violation of its Clean Water Act permit, and we had just begun developing our civil enforcement case. By the time my staff and our attorneys finished calculating a theoretical penalty based on the requirements of the Clean Water Act, it totaled almost $500 million. 
At the time, no judge would have ever considered imposing a penalty of that magnitude, but we had enforcement guidelines that helped us develop a more realistic penalty men, and we opened our negotiations with the company at $55 million. When we first sat down with the United States Steel in Gary, their lead negotiator opened the meeting by saying to us that EPA had placed its proposed penalty on the table and frankly the table had swayed and broken under its weight. <laughs> it was great theater. <laughs> we met off and on for almost a year and while we opened with a proposed penalty of 55 million, U.S. Steel countered with 55,000. I say God. At the end of the year, and getting nowhere, nowhere, one of the bright young attorneys working with me hit upon the idea of having United States Steel Corporation listed as a non-complying contractor for the damage it had caused by its spill into the Grand Calumet River. The implications of being listed as a non-complying contractor were that U.S. Steel, this is the whole company, would be prohibited from selling any steel to any project that received federal funding for one calendar year. This means all grants, subgrants, loans, subloans, contracts, and subagreements. It also means no steel for Navy ships, no rebar for highway projects. The U.S. Steel negotiating team really didn't believe we would do it until the company received a notice from the U.S. Department of Commerce that the process of being listed as a non-complying contractor had been initiated. The tactic did bring them to the table, and it did finally start serious negotiations. And you all should also know that while this was underway, Vice President Dan Quayle called the head of the Chicago EPA office a few times about the case. We, EPA and the Department of Justice, successfully settled the case against U.S. Steel with the company agreeing to do what was necessary to come back into compliance and pay a $34.2 million penalty. However, we didn't want that money going back, simply going back to the Treasury. What we wanted it to do was stay in the area and start fixing the problems. As part of the final settlement, U.S. Steel agreed to dredge the east branch of the Grand Calumet River and safely dispose of almost a million cubic yards of very contaminated sediments. In return, the United States government agreed to take a much smaller cash penalty of $1.2 million. The rest of the funds would be used for dredging. This was the first time that EPA and a defendant had negotiated what's called a SEP. Developing a SEP with a defendant is now a modestly common practice, but we set the precedent here. We also negotiated a SEP with Inland Steel, which is just to the west of U.S. Steel, and that included both dredging along its docks and several innovative recycling and reuse projects. One of my favorite parts. Just an FYI, U.S. Steel has completed the dredging of the east branch of the Grand Calumet River, and you can see the disposal site along the Indiana Toll Road. My second story describes what we did to move the Army Corps of Engineers into dredging the Indiana Harbor and Ship Canal. We knew from the start that we needed the Army Corps of Engineers to dredge the Harbor and Ship Canal. We believed that this was the most effective way of minimizing the toxic pollutants carried by sediments flowing out of the harbor and into the lake. It was 1988 and the harbor hadn't been dredged since 1972. The ore boats coming into the steel companies were light loading because of the depth issues. The core didn't want to dredge because the sediments were seriously contaminated and since the last time they dredged, Congress had passed the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, or RECRA, which now defined hazardous waste and how they were to be handled, stored, and disposed. In meeting with the core, they made it clear that to get them to dredge, they wanted either a waiver of liability under RECRA or that EPA find them a record approved disposal site. Honestly, God, we thought we were sunk. But sometimes the fate smiles, and as they say, timing is everything. Not long after we started working with the Corps, the city of East Chicago, Indiana, visited the EPA office to discuss a serious problem. We learned that the city had acquired, through tax delinquency, a 230-acre site, and it was a former refinery. In acquiring the property, the city also acquired about $2 million in RECRA liability. The previous owners of the property knocked everything down and carried it away, but they didn't clean up the soil or what was underneath. We listened politely. We ended the meeting with promises. We'd see if there was anything that could be done. But truthfully, it was unlikely that we could do anything to relieve the city of its RECRA liability. However, 
Not long after that meeting, an attorney on our team suggested that East Chicago give us the property to use as a dredge disposal site. It was on the Harbor and Ship Canal, and it would save the city $2 million. Of course the city agreed. And we offered it to the Corps of Engineers who quickly said, no thank you, it's contaminated. A few months later, another EPA attorney working with me looked into the bankruptcy proceedings of the East Chicago property. He discovered that there was still $34 million in assets remaining and that it had been tied up in court for over a decade. The previous owners had huge outstanding debts to the company's pension fund and numerous oil companies, and all these claims were being contested. Because of the governor, the, because of the gov, the, excuse me, because of the property's newly discovered wreck reliability, however, the federal government could now file a claim against the remaining assets and jump to the head of the line for payment. <laughs> if successful, this would give us the monies we needed to prepare the site for the core dredging. We developed a we developed for the court a proposed payment plan that would give $20 million to the pension fund and $14 million to the federal government. The court approved the plan. We now had our cleanup monies. We offered the disposal site to the court, who quickly said, no thank you, the site's contaminated. <laughs> Honestly, God, we thought we were home free. We had a disposal site. We had the funds to correctly prepare the site. We even hosted public meetings on what we had planned to do, but still the court said no. We, we learned unofficially that high-level Corps officers in Washington did not want to set a precedent of the Corps dealing directly with contaminated sediments and long-term wreck reliability. We also discreetly learned that the Corps usually deals through a port authority when faced with similar situations. The port authority handles getting the needed permits, any local cost share, the disposal site, and long-term liability. Unfortunately for us, Port Authority did not exist for Indiana Harbor and Ship Canal. So we all took a deep breath and set about establishing one. <laughs> we worked with the state of Indiana and the city of East Chicago and created under state law a unit of municipal government, the East Chicago Waterways Management District. Bingo. <laughs> to end the story, the Port Authority is in place, the dredge disposal site is operational, and the Corps is dredging. Our collective efforts in Northwest Indiana have kept millions of gallons and millions of pounds of polluting materials out of Lake Michigan that otherwise would have gotten in. And needless to say, I'm very proud of what my colleagues and I accomplished. And it shouldn't surprise you when I tell you that Northwest Indiana was probably my most gratifying environmental work. I want to go back to the start of the initial Northwest Indiana plan, and I want to close out three details that uh, were in the plan. First a group of companies stepped up and volunteered to start cleaning up the floating oil. We had our fingers crossed. Several of them, in fact, are still pumping it out from underneath their properties. Second, and we all found this unbelievable, the United States Steel Corporation co-sponsored with EPA a National Pollution Prevention Symposium in Chicago for the iron and steel industry. And third, EPA made a very large investment in working with the citizens of Northwest Indiana, and that investment was the catalyst for a surprisingly collaborative partnership that's developed between industry and the public. So I'm going to pick up where Bob left off. Around um, the mid-2000s or so, many of the leaders in Washington, D.C. were getting a little bit weary of lots of different people coming to Washington, touting how much the Great Lakes mattered, how important they were, but coming to them with a long list of priorities that they could never hope to fund as much as they were on our side. And these are, these are people from both sides and come up with a unified plan for helping the Great Lakes. And that resulted in something called the Great Lakes Regional Collaboration Strategy. It was signed about 10 years ago. And at the signing ceremony were folks like Governor Bob Taft, Republican from Ohio, Governor uh, Rich Daley, or excuse me, Mayor Rich Daley, Democrat from Chicago. We had people from both sides of the aisle show up to sign this document. We had tribes. We had academia. We had NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations, such as the Alliance for the Great Lakes. We had all manner of people showing up in order to say, okay, the time has come. 
No longer are the fisheries people going to stand in one corner and talk to themselves. The chemists stand in another corner and talk to themselves. The lawyers in another corner talking to themselves. We're going to have everybody in the same room talking to each other to have this plan. And this plan came up with a price tag for restoring the Great Lakes at more than $20 billion. So if U.S. Steel blanched at a $500 million or even a $55 million uh, settlement proposal, you can imagine what Congress did when it saw a price tag of some $20 billion. But it was an honest tally of what was thought and still is to help save the Great Lakes, to clean up places like the Grand Calumet River in northwest Indiana. This signing of this document came in 2005. Well, not long after that, really just two years, the campaign for the presidency began in earnest in 2007. And in people's minds at the time, fresh was this plan that was going unfunded. And slowly, presidential candidates one after another, started to recognize that the way into the hearts and minds of the upper Midwest was through the Great Lakes. You look at the states that we have surrounding the Great Lakes. These are very important states. And a pledge, a campaign, a, a, a presidential campaign pledge was put out on the street urging candidates to commit to the establishment of a fund to help finance the kinds of work that Bob mentioned earlier, the cleanup of our areas of concern, assuring that water wouldn't be diverted from the Great Lakes, things like that. We'll talk about this. Maybe we'll get a question about Waukesha and, and water quantity later tonight, maybe. <laughs> In any event, the race was on. And uh, several of the candidates signed a pledge calling for the establishment of this trust. <clears throat> In 2008, one of the candidates came out with a platform on the Great Lakes. And that platform, one of the elements of that platform was calling for a coordinator, somebody who would coordinate the work of 11 federal departments. And I remember seeing this platform that was released in September 2008 and thinking to myself, oh, I pity the poor fill in the blank who has to take that job of coordinating 11 federal departments? Well, I got the call in March <laughs> of 2009, so went into, uh, I, I didn't have time for any self-pity or anything like that. Uh, but the job that I currently have now for Administrator McCarthy entails the coordination of 11 federal departments for her. She chairs this interdepartmental effort. It also entails being the Obama administration's liaison to Capitol Hill on Great Lakes issues, too. So uh, just about every three or four weeks, I'm in Washington. I'll be there virtually all of next week. Uh, most of the time, a lot of the time, to be up on the Hill briefing legislators, senators, congresswomen, congressmen about what's going on, what's important. But what happened was right off the bat, right after inauguration in 2009, uh, the president called for in his proposed budget uh, the establishment of this Great Lakes Trust Fund, which had been called for in the pledge earlier. And in his proposed budget, the president called for $475 million for the first year to help tackle some of the most intractable problems to help fund the heretofore unfunded obligations under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement that Bob mentioned before. And the idea took off. A, uh, a bipartisan Congress, leaders from both sides of the aisle in Congress, supported and funded that trust, now called the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, to the tune of almost, uh, uh, you know, to $475 million that first year. And since then, it's been hovering around $300 million per year or so. And in my work on the Hill, the number one thing that I hear, and this is from Democrats and Republicans alike, is show us the results. You show me the results, and I will continue to be the biggest advocate you have ever seen for this program. 
And, and to this day, we have, through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, one of the programs that has achieved extremely strong bipartisan support. And this has been going on from year to year to year, and it's because of the results. So let's talk about some of the results. Bob mentioned that uh, we were going to talk a little bit about the future and why there's so much hope for the Great Lakes. And I think one large part is because of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, or GLRI as we call it. We immediately came out with a plan to help invest this money. And uh, we came out with a plan February 2010. I still remember sitting around the table with my former boss, Lisa Jackson, then the administrator of the EPA. And we had several governors around the table as well. Um, and we released, released the plan. And what this plan did was look to prioritize five issues that almost perennially were the biggest threats to the Great Lakes. One of them was funding the cleanup of our areas of concern. Another one was preventing and controlling invasive species like Asian carp. Another one was working to reduce runoff, especially from agricultural fields. We also wanted to work on habitat, rebuilding the kinds of wetlands that you saw in the trailer there in northwest Indiana. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but the upper Midwest used to be replete with wetlands. These are marshes that provide so many valuable benefits to us that we can't even begin to calculate them. Uh, one of them is habitat for fish and wildlife. Another is they help to reduce flooding. And, in, you know, and, and as you know, in the upper Midwest, we are prone to flooding around here. When you have flat land, that's what kind of happens. Um, it also helps to purify water, improve water quality. The list goes on and on and on. We also wanted in what we called the fifth focus area to invest in things like making sure we were monitoring and educating the next generation. I'm going to spend most of my time on the first three items, um, but then close out with uh, uh, just a, a note or two on, on the final one. On areas of concern, you just finished seeing one of the better presentations on the history of a very challenging, large cleanup. For those of you who've ever driven through Northwest Indiana, you know you've seen it. Uh, but these are places like the Grand Cal, uh, areas of concern, or AOCs as we call them, that for decades uh, have remained on the cleanup list because they are so difficult and so expensive to clean up. Places like the Grand Cal, places like the Detroit River, places like the Buffalo River. Waukegan Harbor, almost directly across from us in, in northern Illinois, the only one in, um, in Illinois, was once called the world's worst PCB mess. Half of the harbor sediments comprised of PCBs, one of the, one of the most uh, dangerous toxics we, uh, we have faced in the Great Lakes. These places are the places that nobody could love. You know, they were just had been besieged decade by decade by decade with industrial pollution that had settled down into bottom sediments and remained there only to recirculate throughout the Great Lakes system and to pose a public health threat, a dire public health threat, through fish consumption. We needed to do something to get these places, these communities, back on the grid. We didn't need new policy, for the most part. What we needed were resources, and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative helped do just that. Since then, we have invested tens of millions of dollars through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to go back into these communities to do the very kinds of work that you just saw Bob present on. And we're making dramatic progress. The results, that, I'm, that buzzword that I mentioned before, the results are coming in. In places like the Grand Calumet River, we have heard from people who said as recently as five years ago, this place will never get cleaned up. Come back and say, I was wrong. I actually think this place will be cleaned up. And I actually think it's going to be cleaned up in my lifetime. You saw from one of the slides before that there are 20 some areas of concern in the US alone. Thanks to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and its bipartisan support, we now have two new 
areas of concern that have been removed from the list. One of them is Deer Lake in the Upper Peninsula, and then the other one is White Lake, not far from here, a place that since time, almost time immemorial, you know, really decades ago, uh, was another one of these intractable places that just people thought might never get healthy again. It's now been delisted as of November 2014. It's now done. And there are many more that we are making progress on. And it's not just important because it's an environmental thing. I mean, you know, you live in this magnificent area of South Haven. It's, it's just a, a wonderful, beautiful place. When these places are healthy, these harborside and riverside communities around the Great Lakes, when they don't have these problems anymore, they are an attraction. And it helps with the local economies. And who's ever going to argue against local economic health? It's tied to the environment, and it is tied to these cleanups. And thanks to the GLRI, we are now making progress on these places, many of which we never, many people never thought would ever get cleaned up. And, but there's still a lot more to go. Um, we have the next bunch that are slated for cleanup in the next few years. There will be more after that. And as long as the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative continues to show results, and as long as it continues to get bipartisan support, we will finish this list. We will do it. Next, let me talk about um, runoff from agricultural areas. How many of you heard in the news when Toledo's drinking water supply had to shut down because of toxic algae in August of 2014? Fair number of you. Unfortunately, when we fertilize crops using phosphorus-based fertilizers and there's that fertilizer runs off into area waterways, it doesn't just fertilize crops. It actually fertilizes aquatic plant life in our waterways. And that's exactly what happened um, in Ohio almost two years ago. And it has been going on for a long time. Fertilizers running off largely from farm fields through the Maumee River system, which flows through Toledo, was essentially fertilizing uh, a certain kind of algae. Uh, and that uh, one strain of this organism has been, uh, has led to microcystin, which is a, an algae with toxic properties. It can cause li liver damage, it can cause rashes, it can cause uh, brain problems, things like that. You, you don't want to mess with this stuff. But that is what happens when too much goes into a waterway. Using the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, we have funded conservation practices on agricultural lands to slow and reduce the amount of nutrients like phosphorus going into the waterways like the Maumee River system. In fact, what we've been able to do with these investments has been to make sure that we're targeting the investments in the right places and at the right time. And as a result, we've more than doubled the amount of acreage under conservation practices in agricultural fields in places like the Maumee River watershed, which actually covers parts of Michigan, parts of Indiana, but mostly flows through Ohio. <coughs> Another key priority watershed is the Saginaw, right here in Michigan, which demonstrates that it exhibits the same kinds of behaviors with so much farmland around it. And also Green Bay. Many of these places are places that are also demonstrating, exhibiting something called hypoxia. Does anybody want to take a shot at what hypoxia is? Yes, awesome. Lack of, oxygen. Lack of oxygen in the water. And we know fish need oxygen in water. Thank you. You win a prize, maybe a million dollars from the speaker series. <laughs> Not from me. <laughs> uh, thank you for volunteering. Hypoxia means the absence of oxygen. We have places in the Great Lakes that have dead zones, pockets where no oxygen exists to be able to support fish life. You don't need to be a biologist to know that that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. But in order to combat that, we need to reduce the amount of nutrients, fertilizers, washing off into our waterways. You know, just a month and a half ago, Administrator McCarthy, with her counterpart from Canada, announced under the new version of the Water Quality Agreement that Bob mentioned from 2012, 
a new target for phosphorus reduction in, in the uh, western basin of Lake Erie and the central basin of Lake Erie of a 40 percent reduction in the amount of phosphorus going into those waterways. That's a dramatic cut that we need to make in the amount of fertilizers washing off. But in the meantime, these investments are showing results. We need to keep the heat on. Let me close with in invasive species, something else that is incredibly important around this region. One of the other investments that we are making under the GLRI is to control and to prevent invasive species from getting into the Great Lakes. How many of you have heard of sea lamprey? <clears throat> Fair amount of you. How many of you have heard of zebra mussels and quagga mussels? Um, we are using the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to help do research on the control of some of these things. Really interesting science going on using pheromones as attractants to kind of sway lamprey into the right places so that they can essentially be neutralized from breeding. Never science we'd imagine being able to do five or even ten years ago. But we're starting to do that using the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We are also using the Restoration Initiative to try to prevent Asian carp from getting into the Great Lakes. Now these are bad, bad fish. <laughs> S there are different kinds of Asian carp. One of them is uh, big head carp, another is silver carp. Silver are known for being really irritated by the sound of outboard motors, so much so that when an outboard motor buzzes through a waterway that has silver carp in them, they will jump out of the water to get away from the noise. And in places like the Illinois River and the Mississippi, where people have been known to jet ski where there are silver carp, they will jump out of the water and they've been known to break noses, people who are jet skiing around. I mean, they're a public safety threat, not just a public health threat. In any event, some of these fish can eat many times uh, their weight in plankton uh, on an annual basis. Plankton are one of the bases of the food chain. We need plankton. Plankton props up the food web that we all care about. And if Asian carp get into the Great Lakes, and certain places anyway of the Great Lakes, they are like underwater vacuum cleaners. They swim around, scoop out the building blocks to life in our waterways. We can't have that. That's bad. That's not a good thing. Um, and, you know, it's one of these things where invasive species are always a hard thing to kind of talk about, right? Because, look, I'm like you. I have kids. I got to get to the grocery store and get stuff done. Do I have time to really think about invasive species if it's not really like right there at my doorstep about to eat one of my kids or something like that? You know, we all have our priorities. And invasive species, I think, to a lot of people feel several steps removed from the kinds of things that really concern people in their day-to-day -day lives. And that's one of the things that I struggle with. Um, in a role that I play as the co-chair of the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee with now 24 agencies from the U.S. and Canada. But let me tell you this. When you go to the Pacific Northwest, one of the iconic species in that area of the country is Pacific salmon. There are whole tribal nations that stake their identity on Pacific salmon. It is a delicacy. We eat it around here. It, uh, Pacific salmon is eaten all around the world. When you go to the Chesapeake, one of the iconic organisms is the soft-shell crab. Here in the Great Lakes, we have iconic species too. We may not think about it very often, but we have whitefish. We have yellow perch, or lake perch as some people call them. We have lake trout. These are species that matter, and if they are threatened, it is like taking a thread out of a very delicate tapestry. You keep doing that, keep pulling on those threads. Finally, at some point, you will not have a tapestry, which is our web of life in this region. We need to keep these invasive species out, and Asian carp is one of them. So we have invested tens of millions of dollars to prevent them from getting in. You know, I'll close with this little war story. I started the job, the appointment came through in June, started the job in July of 2009. Around August of that same year, a new technology called environmental DNA was showing genetic material from Asian carp in places in the Chicago River system that we never imagined that, they, that, that genetic material should be showing up. 
So two months, effectively one month on the job, it was our holy, again, fill in the blank, moment for us. What does this mean? What do we do? It's not like you can just close off a river system. That's like just corking a sewage treatment plant. You don't want to do that. Um, you know, you, water is meant to flow. And there was a lot of panic, and I remember, because just con these were 18-hour days back then. Bob remembers. Very busy times. What do you do? A lot of panic that these Asian carp were on our back doorstep, and they were going to get in, and they were going to cause widespread ecological catastrophe. We've kept them out. They have not gotten into the Great Lakes. We have not found any evidence of big head or silver carp getting into the Great Lakes. And it's another one of these show me the results moments that is so important and why support for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative on a bipartisan basis continues to be so important. We cannot let our guards down. Asian carp are going to keep coming at us, so we need to keep coming at them to keep pushing them down the Illinois River system and back down into the Mississippi. We have to keep up that fight. We are keeping up that fight. And certainly as long as I'm in this job, um, I want to keep that fight going because that is a fight worth having as long as the Great Lakes are at stake, which I know we all uh, care about. I'm going to close with my favorite note as, uh, as, I as I said I would. I mentioned that one of the other investments that we need to make is in education. And we do use the GLRI to invest in education. Having spent 30 years in this world of protecting the Great Lakes, um, you know, I've seen our problems for protecting and restoring the Great Lakes get more complex. But I promise you this, they are not going to get more simple as time goes by. They're not going to get easier. They're going to get more complex. So we had better continue to invest in the next generation through education helping the next generation to be able to understand what issues and threats are coming their way and do what we can to help capacitize that next generation to take on the mantle of Great Lakes restoration and protection.